Um, I am just overwhelmingly honored uh, to be able to present these people to you. Um, the stories of their lives, um, their teachings, their strivings, um, they have become to me um, very, uh, very close friends. And, um, and, and I hope that that, I hope that you guys will also experience that, where you will learn of these people, um, where you will learn of these people in a way that you become friends with them and you, and you uh, enjoy hearing about them and you're, you're emotionally and, and, and uh, invested in, in what they did to lay the foundation of the church. Um, and uh, I remember when I, Josh mentioned I taught through Martin Luther um, at our church. We just finished that maybe, maybe a couple months ago. Um, I had read um, a couple biographies on Luther and then decided to, to present uh, his life to the church. And um, I, my last lesson on Luther was, was done from the perspective of me doing his eulogy, uh, as if he had died and I was the one doing his eulogy. And uh, I remember uh, just being emotionally overwhelmed at, at, in some ways, closing the book on Luther uh, for these people, because he truly had become um, a friend of mine and uh, a guide and um, an encourager. So um, that is how I feel about this. Uh, very uh, honored, um, and I really hope that I'm able to, to convey the passion that I have for these people. Um, so the first question I want to ask you guys is, why should we study church history? Yes, history is a source of theology. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. There's a gentleman in our church, um, he's one of our elders, and he has a profound love for church history as well, and he uh, said something very, um, I thought, astute when we were studying Luther. He said that studying church history is like studying ecclesiology on how God is building the church, and has built the church, and continues to build the church, and um, I thought that was profound. When I taught, I taught a lesson at, the, at my church a long time ago um, on, uh, it's one of the books I brought actually, on the mission in the early church, how the, how the early church fathers went about doing mission, mission work. How did they spread the gospel? And um, I knew that there would be uh, some tension um, from people with regards to why should we study church history? So I started the, the class in this way. I said, I want you to imagine that you have been working at a company, working a job for 40 years. And um, it you've been working there your whole life. You've become uh, very proficient and uh, very uh, able to accomplish the task that you've, uh, you've become a major part of the company you work for. And uh, you've been working there for 40 years and you decide uh, that it is time to retire and time to, uh, to move on uh, from the job. And um, the, work, the company that you work for, you love them. They come to you and they say, um, listen, we, we appreciate your work. Uh, and we are very happy to send you off into retirement. Uh, we would like you to spend uh, the last couple months at your job uh, training the team of people, the team of people that we are bringing in to replace you, okay? And you, you love your company. You say, I would be honored to do that. I, would, I want nothing, best for the, nothing, better, nothing but the best for this company. So you meet with the team of people that you're going to be uh, working with for the next couple of months, training them to replace you. And uh, as you begin to, to tell them about how you have learned the job and how you do the job, uh, one of the uh, younger members of the team uh, looks at you and he says something like this. Listen, I appreciate all that you know and what you have done and how long you've been at this company, um, but I don't really think that there's much that you're going to be able to help us with in understanding how the job uh, is to be done going forward. Um, you know, you're much older than us. Uh, you uh, don't really, you're not as in tuned with the current generation or culture uh, as we are. So uh, we um, want to respectfully decline 
your help in how to do the job going forward? What would you say to, what, what would be your response to that, to that person? Imagine that. What would be your response? It's not a trick question. I'm not trying to trick you. You're a fool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my response would be, you're a fool. You're a fool for not taking advantage of the years of effort and problem solving and failure and success, taking advantage of these years being freely offered to you and how you are going to do the job now that the person who came before you is no longer here. And I think as a church, as, a, as pastors, we would be fools not to take the lessons and the, the teaching and the stories that have come down to us over thousands of years, not 40, thousands of years. And we would be fools not to listen and hearken to the teachings that are coming to us. So that is why, in essence, we should study church history. <clears throat> um, let me give you a couple of specific reasons. Number one, the church fathers can serve you as spiritual mentors. The church fathers can serve you as spiritual mentors. Um, the ministry... Even when you are surrounded by other pastors, um, is, it can be a very difficult and lonely place. You'll see this. You'll see this. Um, very, very difficult. You are constantly working with people when they are at their highest and when they are at their lowest. In addition to that, you are constantly working with your own issues. Okay? So, um, and... I told Josh uh, when I, I came to the service Sunday, I said it was so refreshing uh, to sit in a service and uh, to not have any responsibilities. I had nothing to do. I was just able to sit here and enjoy the service. And, um, you know, that is not, that is, uh, as, as pastors, we are constantly the ones doing ministry on Sundays, even in small ways. Uh, and it's very hard to be ministered to um, by, by a pastor um, just because there's not as much availability. Well, these, these men can be that for you, right? And, um, and, and, and it's, it's important that you, that you make ut utilization of that value. Um, <clears throat> the second one is that the church fathers offer us a gold mine of scriptural interpretation. Okay, so I want you to imagine... Uh, and this isn't an illustration that it comes from me. This is an illustration that comes from Christ. That you buy a, a plot of land, and you soon discover that there's a gold mine underneath the land. Okay? What are you going to do? Uh, I, don't, I don't really like gold anyway. What are you going to do? I'm not trying to trick you again. You're going to dig, right? You buy a plot of land... They say there's a gold mine underneath it. You're going to dig, right? Well, we are sitting on a plot of land that is a scriptural gold mine. Men like Athanasius, men like uh, uh, Origen, men like um, Ignatius, Polycarp, these men who have given themselves, their lives, to the study and the teaching of the scriptures, and they have passed it down to us. And you will see pages and pages and pages of scriptural interpretation and scriptural application from these guys. And um, we have a gold mine, and I think we need to use it. Um, you might be thinking, uh, why not simply just study the scriptures instead of trying to study the scriptures through the church fathers? And um, I, will, I will admit that that is, that is a valid uh, point. Um, but the, when you get into how these church fathers write, the way they write is very scriptural. They are saturated in the scriptures. Um, there's no question that they did not want to teach you what they thought on anything. 
they wanted to teach you what the scripture says, faithfully passed down by the apostles who were ministered to by Christ. That's all they wanted, okay? Um, They will encourage you. They will motivate you. um, They will uh, um, uh, spur you on in your ministry. Um, What we have to realize is also that we are not new. Are we... Yeah, we are not new, right? As, as pastors, as Christians, it is not our job to be inventors. It's not our job to be reworking the wheel. It's not our job to be innovators, okay? Don't do that. You'll be burned out. Two or three years down the road, you will be burned out. It is your job to be the next link in the chain to the next generation. Pass down the faith that was given to you to the next generation. That's your job. So you don't need to be new. You don't need to be innovating. You don't need to do any of those things. You need to be faithfully passing down the, 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 the faith of the church to the next generation. And these men who have come before you will show you how to do that. Um... They serve us as a track of what to do in ministry. So when you guys, when you guys get into ministry, um, you're, going to, um, you're going to be hit at some point with a, with a question of, uh, man, what, what do I do? What do I stress? What should I study? What should I teach? You're just gonna, you're, you're, there's so many different paths and uh, things you can take and go, and you're receiving... Um, a wonderful education uh, here, and uh, the, the education is going to help you in, in serving as a track. Uh, but but you're going to be you're going to be overwhelmed with there are so many problems that I could begin to start fixing with my church. Where do I start? And the church fathers can serve you as a track, right? The things that they stressed and taught and emphasized, you guys can just do those same things. They stress the preaching of the word above all else. Preach the word faithfully, continually. They stressed faithfulness. They stressed sharing the gospel. They stressed loving your neighbor, loving the church body. They stressed holiness. Flee sin. And if you began to just start doing ministry the way they did it, I think you will find that these, these tricky or innovating ideas of, well, should we uh, do these types of advertisements to get people to come to church, or should we uh, you know, offer this thing, or should we do this, are fine, but they are frosting when the substance of ministry is what these guys did, and we, they can serve us in that way. Lastly, um, uh, you guys had, um, you guys had uh, Brian Blazowski come teach you Romans 8. Uh, Romans, right? Uh, Brian um, is one of my beloved professors. Uh, he, I'm sure that you guys were just overwhelmingly blessed by his teaching in Romans. Um, and uh, and I, I can't say enough about him. Um, I was, I've been listening to the, to the lectures on YouTube uh, that he taught you guys. And just being, I feel like I was sitting in the room with you, just uh, enjoying it. And um, he said something um, in Romans 4 uh, that Paul says, uh, what, about, uh, what about Abraham, our forefather? You guys remember that? And he said, um, who's Paul talking to? He's talking to the Gentiles, right? And he stressed that you guys should think about the Old Testament fathers as your forefathers, and mine as well. And he said that when you teach your kids, you should teach them these heroes of the faith as if they are, because they are, our forefathers. And um, uh, that was just such a profound thought to me, so simple. Uh, But that is how we should think about these people. So when we read about Ignatius and and his faithfulness to to the ministry in spite of death, we can tell our kids and the people that we minister to, 
when they are struggling and going through difficult times, we can tell them, be like Ignatius, right? Be like Ignatius. Um, and without breaking into the rest of the class, uh, I'll leave it at that. Does that make sense? So the question is, is <clears throat> if, I'm, if I'm phrasing it right, um, these, these men had problems, right? They, they, had, they, had mis, they, had, they misunderstood bits of, of Scripture. Um, some of them even lapsed into significant heresy. Um, how do we deal with these men? And, um, and I, I actually uh, uh, sent an email uh, to a, one of my other professors as I was preparing for this class that exact question um, because it is a difficult question. And um, what we need to, and I was going to talk about this actually when we got to Tertullian, um, but what we should, I'll, I'll tell you now, um, the way that I would recommend you think about them and the way that I've adopted thinking about them is that we have to understand that we live in a, even uh, that we as the church in, in 2022 live in an unbelievably blessed, richly blessed time. What sits on the table here, all of these books available to us, and many more, would, would have been to the early fathers an unimaginable wealth. Not only that, but what each of us possess as a hard copy for our own, which of course is the scriptures, is an unbelievable wealth that the early church did not have. Um, it was unheard of for a, a, a lay person to have a copy of their own scriptures. Isn't that crazy? We, I mean, we have multiple copies. We have, a, we have a software program that you can buy every version you want, right? We are just, we can learn Greek. Right? You're taking Greek in the mornings, it's excellent. So we have to understand that we are richly blessed. And what these things do for us is they serve us as a boundary by which we do not make the same mistakes that some of the men who were not as blessed as we are make, okay? So um, there's, a, there's an expression in America, I don't know if you guys have heard it before, uh, but it's, it's an idiom, and it, it, the phrase goes, do not throw out the baby with the bathwater. You guys heard that before? Okay. Do not throw out the baby with the bathwater, meaning... Uh, when, you get, when you give your child a bath and it's time to drain the water out, right, the bad stuff, the gross stuff, uh, make sure that you retain what's important, right? And, uh, you know, don't throw the baby out, right? And uh, that's a parenting tip that you get uh, for free today. Um, and um, so when you read about Tertullian and his lapse into Montanism, uh, a, a profound heresy of the early church, um, you can take it as a warning, um, and then you can also appreciate the fact that Tertullian laid the foundation for how we think about the Trinity. The word Trinity was originated in his writings. Um, so uh, we can appreciate the, the immense value that we have received from them while understanding that we live in an unbelievably blessed time and then we can also say that they were imperfect and made mistakes and uh, that we are trusting that God will sort that out in the end. Does that make sense? So be honest. Be honest with, when you teach, don't hide these things from people. You know, when you teach Tertullian, you need to tell them that, they've, that, he, made a, that he made a mistake. When you teach Luther... Um, Luther made some significant errors with his, with his views of the Jewish people. You have to tell people these things, right? Because they are human beings, right? Human beings who also, uh, who, and, and we as well are human beings, who have significant error and significant sin in our past. Um, and we have been forgiven and have overcome those things by the blood of the cross. And same with these men. Does that make sense? Good, great question. Yeah, we'll talk more about it too. Okay, let me tell you guys 
what I would love for you to do after this class, okay? Um, how I would love for you guys to proceed out of this class. Um, the way that I'm going to approach this class is I'm going to try to lay a wide angled lens on the church fathers. I want to, for, for as much time as we have, I want to talk about as many of the church fathers as we can. Okay? Um, and, and that means that we are not going to be able to go significantly deep uh, into any one of them. Okay? Because uh, I want you to get as much exposure as possible. And this is a very difficult thing to do. Okay, because you want to, because because for almost all of these guys, you could spend a whole week talking about them and their writings, especially the later ones, and their writings are extensive. Okay, so um, what this class is going to do is it's going to be a first step. It's all it's going to be. It's all it can be right now. Um, it's going to be a first step. And what I would love for to happen is for my passion for the church history and for church, for the early fathers. Um, to be communicated to you, and that will motivate you to take upon yourself the study of the early fathers for yourself. Okay? So if some father interests you, okay, um, Athanasius, let's say, and you say, you know what? I would love to read Athanasius. I would love to know. I would, we didn't cover all of his writings in class, but I would love to dig into Athanasius you know, when you finish the, the class, and the, the course that you're in right now, uh, when you have more time to read the things that you personally want to read, right? Because right now you're being assigned the readings that you have to read, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a funny phenomenon. When you have the time to read what you decide to read, uh, that, you, that you say, you know what, I would love to go back and read these guys. Um, read a guy like, uh, you know, read, um, read more of Augustine, for instance. Read more of Origen. Um, these men who uh, laid significant foundation um, for the church. I want to I know what he said about this topic. Um, that is, that is, oh, if that happened, I would just blow me away. I would just absolutely be blessed beyond my wildest dreams for this to happen. Um, so, um, <clears throat> uh, we are, uh, I am trying simply to lay, as we are trying to build a, a house of knowledge about the church fathers, all that we are doing this week is I'm going to say, this is a tool, this is a material, this is something you're going to need, this is this, and then I want you to take it and build the house after. That's what I would love to do, okay? And let me give you some tips as you build, okay? And this is where, uh, this is where we're going to get into the books that we've brought uh, for you guys uh, to, to have in your library. Um, uh, the first tip I would give you is as you build, read the fathers directly, okay? Read the words that they wrote, okay? You're not gonna, you're gonna find a ton of commentary on the fathers, okay? As you begin to dig into this. And that's, my, one of my tips is gonna be to read the commentaries too. But my first tip for you, if you only have the ability, the time to do one of these things, this is what I want you to do. And this is what this stack of books is, okay? So we have uh, the Book of Pastoral Rule by Gregory the Great. You all have uh, printed, co or uh, you have a copy of this in your reader, the whole book, okay? Uh, this is a printed copy, but you have a digital copy of this in your reader. Um, you're going to read this uh, as, as part of the assignment, so you're already building the house, so thankfully. Um, uh, this is On the Holy Spirit by Basil the Great, a great Cappadocian father. Um, in this book, we'll talk about this a little bit, I hope, um, he laid the groundwork for how the church understood the Holy Spirit, being, being a member of the Trinity, being equal with God. Um, his work laid the groundwork for the, count, the Council of Constantinople, where they affirmed the deity of the Trinity. Um, Augustine on, the, on his confessions, um, his uh, autobiography. We're going to discuss a lot of this book, actually. Uh, so I'm excited about that. You could pick that one up. Uh, his work on the Trinity. Um, this is not in this pile. This is a guide. Um, this is Athanasius on the Incarnation. Um, and all of these books are original sources. What the men actually wrote. 
Okay? So these are very good and very valuable uh, to study. Um, so that would be my first suggestion. My second suggestion would be uh, to utilize guides. Okay? Utilize guides to help you study the script to study the fathers. Okay, um, so there's a couple of different ways in which you can utilize a guide. Okay, um, you could read a book like this, "The Story of Christianity" by Justo Gonzalez, and what this is is this is simply um, an overview of church history. Okay, and they, he narrows in a little bit on here and there, but he's he's trying to shoot a wide angle lens as well, so he can't spend too much time. But when you read these, these kinds of books, and then you, you, know, you read Bruce Shelley, Church uh, History in Plain English, um, and he'll, he'll, he'll unpack it in his, in his way as well. Um, when you read these kinds of books, you get a timeline information, okay? And what I mean by that is you start to begin in your mind to form, okay, so Ignatius was really early, and then Polycarp, and oh, they were friends actually, and then Polycarp um, had, a, uh, had a student named Justin, and then he did this, and then oh, well, so then, you know, Constantine rose to power, so then that changed the church, uh, so then these men were serving the church after that, so they're serving in a different way, um, and then you begin to just understand how these men fit into their context, okay? And that's valuable, just absolutely valuable. Um, so then, after that, you can pick up specific helps, okay? So um, this book, uh, which I told Josh, uh, or and I told my brother Zach, um, uh, that this book might not make it um, into my bag because uh, I was going to keep it for myself, um, for my own library. But this book is on defending Constantine and, um, and, and, and how to think about, I think he, uh, he's going to paint him in a pro uh, light, and we'll get to Constantine in a little bit, but this will, this will help under, uh, deepen your understanding of Constantine. And uh, this book is about Basil of Caesarea. These books, um, we're, we're not going to have time uh, to talk about these books very much at all, um, but these books are excellent. And they are um, uh, a conglomeration of the writings of the fathers uh, formed into specific topics. So this is called Living Wisely with the Fathers. So holiness in your life, you can gain a understanding of that. This is how to worship with the fathers, what they said about worship. This is how to read the scripture with the fathers. And this is how to learn theology with the fathers. Just Excellent. So, these, so Christopher Hall wrote these books, and he compiles these writings together. So he's being your guide. He's, he's taking you on a tour of the early fathers, and you're following him along. It's just such a helpful thing, right? Um, you know, if you went to go hike a mountain or you went to go uh, take a trip that was a, an extensive trip, uh, and, you, and you weren't sure of the map, you would take along a guide, Right? so that you don't get lost and you don't get overwhelmed or anything like that. And he can help you as you walk through these big things. Um, and, uh, and, and the book that you have, Michael Haken, um, he takes you uh, on a tour of specific guys. Okay, So um, if you haven't cracked it already, um, he's going to take you through Ignatius, the letter to Diognetus, uh, Cyprian and Ambrose, um, uh, Patrick of Ireland, these guys. Um, he will take you on a tour of these guys, their work, their life, and, um, and how they can help you. So those are, so, so I would say read the early sources um, and don't get overwhelmed. They are long and, and can be difficult to read. Um, there's, a, there's a very, uh, uh, very helpful quote um, <clears throat> by, by Pastor John Piper. He says, um, if you rake, if you rake, you'll get leaves. If you dig, you'll get gold. If you rake, you'll get leaves. If you dig, you'll get gold. And these guys are digging, okay? These are not easy reads, okay? Um, you'll see that when you get into the, the, to the reading thing that I've given to you. Um, these are not, you're going to have to read them slowly, okay? I have to read them slowly. They are, they are very difficult to understand. Um, but they are worth it. They are worth it. I promise you they are worth it. Um, and lastly, for the introduction, what I would love is that you, do n that you will not allow the material and the knowledge and the passion 
that you have developed for the fathers, or for that matter, for anything that you learn in this, in this course and in, in, the, in your schooling uh, for the whole thing. You will not allow the blessing that you've been given to stay with you. You will be forced to impart. You must. You must teach. There are going to be people in your church who are going to be going through significant trial. And you are going to be able to impart to them encouragement from the fathers that will help them. There's going to be people who are struggling to understand the faith. And there's going to be knowledge that you're going to be able to impart to them from the fathers. And my uh, exhortation to you is that you are not silent, okay? That you teach, okay? It's so important that you pass it on. Um, uh, Gregory, in his book on pastoral rule, actually uh, um, has that as one of his rules for a pastor. That first, before he teaches, he learns, which is what you guys are doing right now. And then after he learns, he must teach. You have to. You have to. Let me, let me just end this introduction with a quote by Charles Spurgeon. It seems odd that certain men who talk so much of what the Holy Spirit reveals to themselves should think so little of what he has revealed to others.